We meditate every night because we see its importance. The mind needs to be trained. This is the best way to do it. The problem is when it becomes a daily routine or a nightly routine, it starts getting routine. We go through the motions, stop paying attention, which means we miss out on a lot of the opportunities that come from meditating. So I have to learn how to make it special every night. Part of that we do, which is part of the routine, is with the chance we have in the beginning. We think about the Buddha and the Dharma and the Sangha. And you can sit here and just parrot the words. You get that glazed look in your eyes as you stare off. But it's better to stop and think. Who was the Buddha? What was his Dharma like? Who was the Noble Sangha? What kind of example they set for us? Try to focus on the things that you find especially inspiring. To induce an attitude of respect. So when the time comes to meditate, you have some respect for the meditation. Respect for your breath. Respect for your desire for true happiness. Respect for what can be learned by watching the present moment. That's us where the Buddha gained his awakening. He's watching his breath. And the Dharma keeps pointing right here. This is where the work is to be done. And the noble Sanghas guaranteed that yes, the Buddha was right. And they invite us to join them. So keep that attitude in mind and bring some respect. How do you show respect for the breath? One is you try to be very observant. As John Fuhn used to say, if your powers of observation are coarse, you're going to get coarse things. If they're more refined, you get more refined things. And John Lee's example is of sifting flour. If the sifter has just a coarse weave, you get big lumps. But if it's very fine, it takes longer, but you get fine flour. And then you sift it again, you make the weave even more refined, and you get even more refined flour. The price of the flour goes up, the quality of things you can do with the flour goes up. So trying to be observant and refined in your powers of observation. Make a survey of the body from the head down to the toes, the head, toes back up to the head. When you breathe in, where do you feel the breath? Where do you not feel the breath? Look at the areas where you don't feel it, and see if you can detect something. Sometimes there's a blockage which makes it difficult for there to be any sensation there. So work through the blockage. Other times you begin to realize that the breath was moving there, simply that your powers of observation were too, too coarse to, to detect it. It's like listening to a piece of music that's far away. You have to get yourself very, very quiet and listen to very detailed things. In fact, the Buddha himself said that one of the ways you develop discernment, and this is the other way in which you make each evening special, is you're working on your discernment. One of the things that nurtures discernment is a willingness to listen. Now, on the external level, this could be listening to someone else talk about the Dharma. But on the internal level, listen to what's going on. Pay careful attention. And the other quality that nurtures discernment is to ask questions. And again, you can ask questions outside of other people, 
And when you get to meditate, ask questions in your mind. What are you doing? And look, observe. Ask questions about the breath. Ask questions about your relationship to the breath. Dogen has a nice passage. He says, you can s simply take the body sitting here as your object and ask questions about it. Is the mind sitting in the body? Is the body sitting in the mind? Who's doing the sitting? Does the mind sit? Or is it just the body that sits? You can ask all kinds of questions. And you'll find that as you ask the questions, you break things open a little bit. There's a little hint of something that you may not have seen before. So you ask more questions and bring that quality of refinement to the question, to your powers of observation, to your listening. Because as you get more and more sensitive to the breath, it gets you more sensitive to the mind. What's the mind doing right now? And what you want to see is there are things that are going on in your experience right now that, are, that you're actually doing, and you're taking them for granted. In some cases, you don't even assume that you're doing them, they're just there. But the fact that you have a perception of the shape of the body, that's, a, that's an activity. You have a perception about how the breath comes in, how the breath goes out. You have a perception of where you are in the body in relationship to the breath. You can ask questions. How about changing that? Last night I mentioned one of the drawbacks of the phrase, watch your breath, is that it assumes that the breath is out there in front of your eyes when it's actually behind your eyes. Another one of the drawbacks, though, is that you get the sense that the knowledge just has to be up in your head. Actually, there's an awareness in your hands, in your feet, in every part of the body. And you can let the awareness stay there, that the awareness of the breath coming in and going out. The awareness of the breath in the knee is in the knee. The awareness of the breath in the foot is in the foot. Then try to connect those spots of awareness. Because the right kind of question, it doesn't simply sit there asking questions. It comes up with hypotheses and then you test them. How about if we do this? How about if we do that? And the hypotheses are basically questions about what other things you could be doing right now to get the mind to settle in more deeply. And so you can t detect those things that it's doing that you don't realize it's doing. I was reading a piece a while back saying that discernment is a bad translation for banya. Banya is a profound knowledge, where discernment is just seeing the difference between this and that, or the connection between this and that. But how are you going to find profound knowledge if you don't start with seeing the difference between this and that, the connection between this and that? After all, in Pali, the word banya, which is sometimes translated as wisdom, I prefer discernment, it's related to a verb, bajanati. And the way the Buddha uses bajanati covers a wide range of mental functions in which you see the difference between one thing and another. It starts with something really simple, detecting long breathing and short breathing. That's not having profound knowledge of long breathing or profound knowledge of short breathing. It's simply detecting the difference. And from detecting the difference, then you begin to see, well, what effect does one have on the body? What effect does another have? What effect do they have on the mind? 
by detecting the difference, you can start asking questions. And then you detect things that are more subtle, and you ask more subtle questions. It moves on to detecting when, you, say, sensual desire is present, when it's absent. Detecting when good things are present or absent, like analysis of qualities. It goes into detecting what are you doing that's causing suffering. You're discerning these differences. You're discerning connections. And it's simply a question of seeing activities you didn't realize were activities. Detecting the fact that they are activities, and they're part of a causal chain. And you can begin to see how you can manipulate that causal chain in a good direction. This is what makes each evening's meditation special. When you ask a question, it comes up with an interesting answer. Then the answers will be very particular to you. The basic pattern will be the same for everybody, which is why we can communicate, why we can talk about the drama. But one person can't get into another person and say, look here, this is a short breath, this is the effect it has. You have to see that for yourself. It's like we're sending messages over walls. The Buddha found things on his side of the wall, and then he sends messages over the walls to the rest of us, for us to look on our side of the wall. As he said, he points the way. It's up to us to really look, to be observant, to be honest in our powers of observation. That's why those are the two qualities he asked for in a student, being honest and observant, but also a willingness to listen and a willingness to ask questions. The main framework for the questions is the Four Noble Truths. What are you doing that's causing unnecessary stress? What could you do to let go of the cause? And it's simply a matter of taking those two questions and learning how to apply them to the particulars of your experience. Because each breath is particular, each movement of the mind is particular, and they follow general patterns. Which is why examining an individual event in the mind will help you see patterns. And then you observe it again and again, and the pattern gets more and more clear more useful when it's clear. So there are days when things settle down and it's very, very quiet, and that can be special. But the problem is you can't carry that quiet around with you all the time. When things are quiet, you want to learn. Okay, why was it quiet? What can I learn from this that I can apply the next time around? That's what you can carry from one meditation to the next. And that's what makes each meditation special. When you observe, when you listen, you ask questions. And a realization comes that you can then test. So learn to have an attitude of respect for the fact that we do this every night. And this is something that really is valuable. And every breath is teaching something. Every movement of the mind is teaching something. And if you listen carefully enough and are inquisitive enough, you can pick up what it's teaching. So do what you can to develop the right attitude toward each meditation. Because then you'll be able to come away with something of real value.